creationists often point to amazing design and living things as evidence for a designer. But what about evidence we see of bad design today on Creation Magazine Live? Welcome to Creation Magazine Live. I'm Richard Fangrad. And I'm Calvin Smith. Uh, this week we're talking about supposed arguments for bad design and how that uh, refutes creation. Yeah. Uh, what about things, the argument goes, what about things that don't look well designed or appear to have been designed to do bad things? Right. That's the, that's the argument. Yeah. It's, it's one of the tired old arguments that evolutionists have used, that anti-theists have doled out for many years. Uh, it, one of them is the claim that the eye is just stupidly wired. Right. It's just yep. it's wired backwards, wired back to front, something that no decent designer would ever do. That's, <laughs> right. that's the accusation from, for example, Richard Dawkins. Yep. In his book, The Blind Watchmaker, a very famous book, he says this, any engineer would naturally assume that the photocells would point towards the light with their wires leading backwards toward the brain. He would laugh at any suggestion that the photocells might point away from the light with their wires departing on the side nearest the light. Yet this is exactly what happens in all vertebra vertebrate retinas. The photocell is in effect wired in backwards with its wire sticking out on the nearest side of the light. The wire has to travel over the surface of the retina to a point where it dives into a hole in the retina, the so-called blind spot, to join the optic nerve. It means that the light, instead of being granted an unrestricted passage to the photocells, has to pass through a forest of connecting wires, presumably suffering at least some attenuation and distortion, actually probably not much, but still, uh, it is the principle of the thing that would offend any tidy-minded engineer, interesting <laughs> terminology there. I don't know the exact explanation for this strange state of affairs. The relevant period of evolution is so long ago. However, eye experts, <laughs> eye experts, which Dawkins uh, isn't, and, and, and which he isn't, yes, have denounced Dawkins' claim repeatedly. Yep. For example, George Marshall, the Sir Jules Thorne lecturer of ophthalmic science, stated in reply to Dawkins, in reply to this argument, the idea that the eye is wired backwards comes from a lack of knowledge of eye function and anatomy. <laughs> which <laughs> Dawkins lacks. I mean, I mean, come on, the eye is badly designed. Let's think about this. If any scientist on the planet were to come up with a machine that was advanced as, as, as the human eye, yes, yeah. uh, including all the software you know, needed to integrate that so the brain can actually understand what, what's going on there and all the interface, they'd be awarded a Nobel Prize. Yeah, you wouldn't yeah. be sitting there judging them, saying, well, that's a terrible machine. You'd be awarding them prizes. And you know, not only is the inverted wiring of our eyes actually a good design, it's, it's necessary for proper functioning. Right. It's also co coordinated with an, an ingenious fiber optic plate, or the equivalent of. So the vertebrate eye uh, has the advantage of a, a rich blood supply uh, behind the receptors without the disadvantage of nerves blocking out light. So that kind of fine coordination uh, of parts actually uh, really makes sense with a master designer. But that, that's, uh, that's a terrible argument for evolutionists. Yeah, for all, for all the bluff from many evolutionists, uh, that creationists use theology rather than science, uh, notice that Dawkins was really using a theological argument here. That's right. Uh, not a scientific one. Uh, he was claiming that a designer wouldn't design something like this rather than scientifically demonstrating evolution. Right. It was a theological argument that he used there. Exactly. Uh, and he, he actually admitted that he was ignorant of an evolutionary explanation anyway, yes, right? Yes, yes. So, so Dawkins claimed that the nerves uh, obstruct the light has been falsified by new research uh, by scientists at Leipzig University. They showed that the vertebrate eye has an ingenious feature that overcomes even the slight disadvantage of nerves in front of light receptors. The light's collected and funneled uh, through the nerve net to the receptors of the Mueller cells which act as optical fibers. Each cone cell has one Mueller cell guiding uh, the light to it, while several rods can share the same Mueller cell. So the Mueller cells work almost exactly like a fiber optic plate, as I mentioned earlier, that optical engineers can use to transmit an image uh, with low distortion without using a lens. The cells even have the right variation in, the, in uh, 
refractive index for image transfer through the vertebrate retina with minimal distortion and loss. So indeed, these Mueller cells are even better than uh, optical fibers uh, that we make because uh, they're funnel-shaped, which collects more light for the receptors and, and the wide entrance to the Mueller cells cover the uh, entire surface of the retina uh, so they collect the maximum amount of light. So they're, they're yeah. perfectly designed by, <laughs> by everything we can actually see. Yes, and one researcher said this, nature is so clever. <laughs> this means that there is enough room in the eye for all the neurons and synapses and so on, but still the Mueller cells can capture and transmit as much light as possible. Yes, isn't, isn't that amazing? Yeah, isn't it interesting that they call nature clever because of how good it is, but Dawkins calls it, calls it bad design, yes. if it was a designer. Anyway. Different, uh, standards, I guess. And we'll be back. <laughs> Is the human genome full of parasites? This might sound like a ridiculous question, but some biologists claim that it is. The Human Genome Project revealed that a large proportion of human DNA is composed of transposable elements. These DNA segments copy themselves and move around the genome. Some scientists have claimed they serve no function and have dismissed them as parasitic DNA. Evolutionists even claim that similarities with chimps in these supposedly useless bits prove evolution. But new research shows they have functions. One study revealed that transposable elements activate during embryo development in mice to control gene expression. Another study showed that these elements concentrate in gene-dense regions to control gene expression. They are not randomly spread throughout the genome as previously thought. So the human genome isn't full of parasites after all, but it's full of sophisticated ways to control gene expression. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. Welcome back. If you just tuned in, we're talking about the so-called bad design arguments, how, how this wouldn't uh, lead to a, an intelligent creator. Right. Um, one argument put forth by evolutionists is the poor design of the panda's thumb. Right. The panda's thumb. On closer inspection, however, there is nothing clumsy about it at all. The thumb is part of an elaborate and efficient grasping structure that enables the panda to strip leaves from bamboo shoots. Yeah. What See, ingenious. <laughs> One of the problems with these types of arguments is they're kind of vacuous anyway, because here's what they're saying. It's almost like they're trying to change the subject. You know, mm -hmm. if an evolutionist, it's like they're saying, well, look, if you, if you found a watch on a beach, right, and you try to deny the existence of the watchmaker, uh, you know, because, well, the watch has so many flaws that nobody could have made it. Yeah, like, it shows the wrong time. <laughs> yeah, it shows the wrong time, so no, obviously nobody created it. This is really what they're, it, yeah. it's not really yeah. a good argument. Anyway, uh, the panda's thumb. Well, the panda uh, has five digits, none of which are opposable to each other, but in addition, they, they possess a uni unique enlargement of, of two wrist bones, which in, in effect gives it seven fingers, and these two digits come into play whenever the panda uses them to grasp bamboo in, in a kind of a pincer-like movement of these digits. So owing to the kind of superficial resemblance to uh, one of the enlarged wrist bone digits, they, they call it the panda's thumb. and. Uh, this is the argument that they're trying to make. Right. Now, here are famous evolutionists, uh, Stephen Jay Gould and others, uh, uh, other evolutionists' arguments that this supposedly proves evolution, the, the panda's thumb. Right. Um, now, note that he was arguing about supposed flaws in orchids as well as the, the, the panda's thumb, etc. Where this quote's uh, from, yeah. when, when he said this. If God had designed a beautiful machine to reflect his wisdom and power, surely he would not have used a collection of parts generally fashioned for other purposes. Orchids were not made by an ideal engineer. They were jury-rigged from a limited set of available components. Thus, they must have evolved from ordinary flowers. So, and, then, and then Gould applies the same premise to the panda's thumb. He says oh, yeah. this, The panda's thumb provides an elegant zoological counterpart to Darwin's orchids. An engineer's best solution is debarred by history. The panda's true thumb is committed to another role, too specialized for a different function to become an opposable manipulating digit. So the panda must use parts on hand and settle for an enlarged, an enlarged wrist bone and a somewhat clumsy but workable solution. Right, so, so. if you want to sum up Gould's arguments, they, they can be put this way, right? A creator god should not design structures that are similar to other structures he designed. That's one of the things okay. basically yep. said. Human engineers don't modify pre-existing structures when designing new structures, so no so sensible human engineer would construct something like the panda's thumb. And the structures in question are jury-rigged, and the structures are functional but inelegant. That's basically his, his arguments okay. here. Okay, summarize but, the arguments. Yeah. You know, that, um, let's examine this. Number one, it, it's completely untestable. There's no way of knowing 
right? Apart from revelation, <laughs> what yes. God would or would not do um, when he's creating something. And, and why wouldn't God use similar uh, component parts. Absolutely. I, I mean, yeah. you know, we, we, we use wheels. They work really well. We use them in little red wagons. We use them in airplanes. Why wouldn't God use similar things that work well? And it's not a right. good argument. Yeah, and, and point number two is just totally false. Human engineers do, in fact, model, modify pre-existing structures. <laughs> they do it all the time. We yeah. can say even, for example, the, the wedges of scissors are similar to the flat surfaces of tongs or pliers. We, we modify things all the time. Yeah. So. Uh, question or objection number three, it, well, jury rigged? How do we know these things were jury rigged? How He's assuming know? evolution yes. to assume uh, evolution that presupposes the, the the argument. So that that kind of breaks down. I mean, do, do pandas thumbs were they really jury rigged from other things? No, pandas don't have to paint. They don't have to type. They don't have to do all the things that humans do. Pandas bones do exactly what they're supposed to do for pandas. Right. So they're just yeah. <laughs> it's not jury rigged from anything. And, and that brings us to the the point number four. Functional but inelegant? What, what sort of an argument is that? Uh, a hammer is inelegant, but it works pretty good. A lot of people use them. A fist is inelegant, but it's functional. You want to pound on the table or something. A hook and eye bolt is functional. Uh, maybe it's inelegant to the door or, or something. Or but to it, a door handle or something, yeah. Uh, but uh, how, is, how is that uh, proof that it wasn't designed? Uh, Far from being an example of bad design, a recent study by, the, uh, by a team of Japanese investigators uh, makes this fact vividly obvious. Right. They said, the three-dimensional images we obtained indicate that the radial sesamoid bone uh, cannot move independently of its articulated bones, as has been suggested, but rather acts as part of a functional unit of manipulation. The radial sesamoid bone and the, ex the accessory carpal bone form a double pincer-like apparatus, enabling the panda, panda to manipulate objects with great dexterity. We have shown that the hand of the giant panda has much more refined grasping mechanism than has been suggested in previous morphological models. Exactly. So, so much for the bad design argument. Exactly. We'll be right back. Genesis Verse by Verse is a Bible study tool available on CMI's website, designed to help pastors, students, and laymen alike study the book of Genesis like never before. And it's completely free. Simply look up any verse in Genesis 1 to 11 or just scroll down the page. The center column provides links to articles that answer common questions pertaining to that verse and the topics that naturally arise from them. Visit creation.com to use it today. If you just tuned in, we're talking about arguments of bad design, examples of bad design supposedly showing that there's no creator. Right. That's what we're talking about. Well, typical of many evolutionary critics, a noted uh, zoologist teaching at a major university, claimed that the human pharynx is a poorly designed system, explicable only in terms of macroevolution. The mm. example he gives is, is it designing a building, let's say, with water and gas entering through a common chamber, so that uh, whenever one's needed, you'd have to turn the other one off. And of course, he, he claims that this design would be the height of stupidity. But that is what your intelligent creator did when he designed and created man. For as you know, the pharynx serves as a common passageway for air and water. Think of the number of lives that have been lost by food or water getting into an obstructing uh, or obstructing the air passageway. It certainly would have required very little intelligence for the creator who have designed a more efficient and less dangerous arrangement. However, if you trace the evolution of the head and especially the development of the food and respiratory passages, passageways from the fishes up through the amphibians, reptiles, and early mammals to man, you will note that the relationship turns out to be a masterpiece of evolutionary achievement, enabling aquatic organisms to become adapted to air breathing and thus capable of living on land. Okay, so what yeah. critics are saying is that they know what a designer should have done. Right. They, they know what a designer should have done, and there should be two tubes to prevent choking. Right. That's, the, that's what they're saying. And it's a well, masterpiece of design if it wasn't a creator that did it. A masterpiece of design if it wasn't a... You could talk about that too. You can see the contradiction there, right? Yeah. Despite the claim of poor design, let's talk about design, uh, the pharynx is an example of a superbly designed complex system. Mm -hmm. The pharynx serves as a single passageway for not two but three systems, the respiratory, digestive, and communicative. We're also talking through, right. our, through our throat uh, for many good reasons. Uh, a major one is, unlike other primates, our airway and esophagus intersect, which allows speech. As right, we the, just said. the pharynx connects the air ca uh, channel to the elementary canal, and this designs uh, uh, allows both disposal of uh, excess moisture 
uh, in the air channels right. um, and any kind of debris in the lung system that's filtered uh, from the air by the bronchial mucus. Of course, the mucus is moved up by the lungs by the cilia, those little uh, hair-like things, and then swallowed. And this design, uh, design allows the creation of air pressure bursts, right? If you need to cough or you need to sneeze, that, that, that system allows that to happen so you can, you know, clear, the, out, yeah. clear the nose or throat or anything yep. like that. And, uh, of course, this design allows both uh, simultaneous eating and breathing, right? Um, right. And, and with a lot less bulk. I mean, think of it. Oh, it would have been a better design to have two, two or three tubes. Well, then th how big would your neck have to be and, and all that kind, kind of things. Um, and, of course, the system actually stops you breathing when you're eating and, 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 right. and so forth. So it, it's, it's brilliantly designed. Yeah, another problem with the imagined two-tube design is that the more body openings there are, the more chance you have for infection. And, uh, and that's it, by using three openings instead of the present one, the likelihood of uh, infections would increase significantly. Also, the sense of taste is intimately, follow, intimately involved with smell. Right. And so you've got that combined as well, another great design feature. Exactly. When you think about the so-called problems here, how many people have died, well, humans swallow about 1,000 times a day, or 27,375,000 times in an average <laughs> lifespan. Yikes. So given this fact, you know, life-threatening choking events is, is pretty small comparatively when, when you think of the amount of swallowing events in someone's lifetime. I mean, if, in the vast majority of cases, um, problems only arise with misuse or a degeneration of the system. Uh, and, and this totally makes sense in, in a biblical worldview where you've got uh, disease and, 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 and decay and things like that coming in after the fall. Right. right? So if, if those things that he complained about were just misuse or degeneration of the system, then it can't be used as evidence for bad design. Exactly. Right? It's, it's, it's a good design that takes into account uh, um, neither unwise usage of the design or subsequent degeneration of the system. It's a good design. Exactly. Uh, I mean, if, if you gave me the task and you said, Cal, look, I, I want you to build a machine and it's got to have, be able to do 12 different operations. Yeah, okay. Yeah. You know, and, and I came up with the system, but I, I, every one of these operations I had to have separate pieces of, you know, and so there's a big bulky machine. Or I said, look, I can do it and do this. Put it all in one thing and it'll yeah. do all 12. I think I'd get the, I think I'd get the prize. you the prize. <laughs> exactly. And we'll be back. Scientists have just found out what you always wanted to know. Why do fingernails, when nibbled or torn, tend to tear across the nail rather than downwards towards the nail bed? Well, by analysing nails under the electron microscope, the reason became clear. Nails are made of three layers containing the protein keratin. The keratin fibres have a specific arrangement that prevents breaks from running down the nail and also gives the nail tremendous strength. Without this arrangement, according to one of the researchers, every tear would damage our nail bed, inflicting great pain and incurring infection. A similar pattern is seen in horses' hooves, which is just as well, because if cracks were to run upwards instead of across in a horse's hoof, it could lead to infection, lameness and death. How could anyone say that this crucial design feature of hooves and fingernails has come about by accident? The evidence surely shouts designer. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. All right, let's continue with examples of so-called bad design right. that evolutionists are using to bash creationists over the head and say, <laughs> you guys, there's no designer. Right. Uh, one argument that evolutionists have proposed is that the prostate is an example of bad design. Here we go with the prostate. Okay, so this is a walnut-sized gland in male mammals that secretes a clear, uh, slightly alkaline liquid, comprises about 10 to 30 percent of the volume of semen. Thus, it's a vital organ for reproduction and, uh, of course, some critics of uh, you know, creation or intelligent design complain that it's badly designed because the urethra, the tube uh, through which the urine flows out, passes through it. So if the prostate enlarges, prostate enlarges it uh, restricts urine flow. Um, however, the positioning makes a great deal of sense when you, when you look at it. Rather than the urethra going uh, through the prostate, it's more accurate to actually consider the prostate as a thickening of the urethral wall and it produces a major component of semen, so it's in the right place doing its job. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, the prostate secre secretions have to be injected into the urethra at just the right time to join up with the spermatozoa from the testicles. The prostate arrangement means that its glands secrete into ducts that open independently into the urethra. The whole prostate contracts during ejaculation and its smooth muscle quickly empties its contents, contents and forces the semen along. 
The prostate also contains nerve plexus and is responsible for much of the pleasure of male sexual activity. So it's pretty important. Yeah. So, <laughs> so why did the designer not simply place the prostate alongside the urethra? Presumably okay. because it would require a new duct system, uh, an extra system to propel its excretions and uh, propel the semen along. So you, again, it's, it's, you, you've got to add more things. This is, this is brilliant design because you're, you're just putting it all together, Absolutely. right? Absolutely, yeah. The, the prostate also acts as a spacer between the bladder and the uh, urogenital diaphragm. This provides a support for the bladder and uh, prevents the urethra uh, kinking when the bladder's full. Otherwise, extra ligaments and, and, uh, and attachment structures would be required. Uh, this position could also be necessary to shut off urine flow during ejaculation. And in, actually, indeed, one uh, potential problem uh, if you have your prostate removed is that uh, you can have incontinence. <laughs> right. Uh, as for the problem with enlargement, uh, they're not normal features, but pathological ones. So in a biblical framework, they would be regarded as post-fall, as right. something that's caused by Adam's original sin and then the curse on creation. So it's in a biblical framework that they would be, uh, it, that we can understand these things. In any case, even by age 80, only about half of men actually uh, have significant enlargement of, of the gland, and only a quarter have urinary symptoms, the, the problems there. In many men, the prostate actually shrinks and, uh, as, as they get older. If this was a design problem, all men would suffer from it. Factors involved in prostate problems include uh, hormone imbalance, obesity, infections, uh, uh, medicinal side effects, and mutations. Right. For example, uh, Japanese men living in Japan have uh, much less problems where if uh, a Japanese person, a Japanese man goes to America, uh, Canada, starts eating the same types of foods <laughs> that we typically have over here, all of a sudden they develop these problems. It's dietary. Dietary. So, yeah. you know, when they're eating, uh, you know, things rich in omega-3 fatty acids and things like that, um, or anybody is, not just them, but uh, as an example, um, they don't have these problems. So what you tr typically find with these bad design arguments is they forget the history that's in the Bible. See, we have to look at not only just what's happening today, but what happened then. God created everything perfectly. Sin and death entered into the world. It's been degenerating yes. now for, yes. for many thousands of years. It's getting worse and worse and worse. But in a perfect world, if there's no disease, if there's no decay, no bondage to sin, these things work perfectly. Those designs would be ideal in a world where there's none of, none of the, uh, the decay that we see today because it, of the curse. Exactly. Yeah. Now, um, there's a, a great book on design and that actually deals with some of these arguments and That's Dr. Right. Jonathan Serafiti has written it. It's called By Design, Evidence for Nature's Intelligent Design or the God of the Bible. You know, uh, many people talking about intelligent design, well, that's kind of where they stop. Some yes. intelligent designer designed this place. But who's, who's who, the designer? Who is that's it? The, yes. Yeah, his name's <laughs> Jesus. Um, that's what you're going to find out uh, if you read this book, or eventually sometime anyway. But uh, really uh, recommend this book. You can go to our website, creation.com, get to the checkout, put in the code CMLBD, and uh, you're going to get 30% uh, off your, your purchase. And uh, it, it's chock full of just brilliant examples of design and refutes these arguments as well. And we'll be back. Creation Ministries International edifies the body of Christ by providing more than 30 years of Bible-supporting scientific research, delivered through speaking engagements, books, magazines, and a variety of media, much of which is archived on our website, creation.com. Did you know that if you read three articles on creation.com each day, it would take over seven years to read them all? Such a wealth of information didn't arise by chance, however. We do this through the faithful prayers and gifts of our supporters, which also fund ongoing research. Support the building up of the church by partnering with CMI. Donate today at creation.com slash donate. Well, welcome back. And uh, this is in our feedback section. We often get people commenting on our website from different articles or they yep. just have a question and, or something like that. We encourage that, by the way. Go to creation.com and, and if you have questions that you can't find answers to on the Q&A section or within our articles, feel free to contact us. But anyway, this fella uh, wrote in. He's a, uh, a Christian and the, the title of the feedback was called Handling Ag Aggressive Atheists. And this fella, N.W. from Australia, write, wrote this. As a Christian, I find sharing the gospel very difficult. Not that I don't know how, but in how do you respond to atheists who angrily attack Christianity? I'm finding no one can have a normal discussion. Maybe you can touch on this or point me to an article that can address this. Yeah. And uh, yeah. Keaton Halley uh, actually wrote back and he's got some good practical tips here. And we'll, we can just walk through a couple. But, uh, you know, really, there, there isn't really a, a, a simple formula. 
for handling yeah, a, a hostile for, atheist. I mean, in a sense, it's kind of like, well, handling anybody that's hostile against you for any reason, of course, that can be intimidating, it can be upsetting, you know, sure. things like that. Yeah. We just need to understand, I think, first and foremost, that this is a spiritual battle. So right. try to remove your emotion, right. try to move your, that, that initial reaction and just go, okay, th we're talking about this person's soul here. Yes. And, and let's, yeah. you know, go for and, that. Yeah, and there are some other guidelines here that, that, that Keaton uh, listed in the article here. Yep. Uh, so uh, number one, consider yourself blessed and rejoice that you are enduring hardship, even if it is as uh, minor uh, as you're, you're being mocked, as yep. minor hardship for Christ's sake. First Peter 4, 13 and 14, uh, your reward is in heaven. Uh, Matthew 5, the, the Beatitudes there, blessed are those who are persecuted for the name of Christ. Right, so you should actually consider it a blessing. Like, yeah, but that, that's that what takes, the apostles did. Yeah, so yeah. It's, it's kind of a mental thing you have to do. They'll go, oh, oh wait a sec, this is a good thing, not yep. a bad thing. You know? I'm, I'm storing up treasure for myself in heaven. Yeah, being persecuted. <laughs> yeah that's right, yeah. lay it on me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, don't respond in kind since we're not to return evil for evil, 1 yes. Peter 3, 9, but to keep a clear conscience, 1 Peter 3, 16, and we should not answer a foolish person by adopting his bad behavior or a wrong way of thinking, Proverbs 26, 4. And uh, uh, there's an article you can uh, look up on the website, don't answer, do answer, it's a good by article. the way. Yeah. yeah, it's a really good answer. And... Uh, Though directness and strong words are sometimes called for, um, you know, remember that a soft answer turns away wrath, Proverbs 15.1. I think some people misunderstand the difference between uh, someone reacting strongly and, you know, boldly and, and, and with being aggressive. Right. Yeah, a, a firm answer means giving a good response, responding to the information, right. but not, I think it's more of an emotional thing. Right. Don't, don't get your blood pressure up and rah, you attack this other guy. That's right. But it's, respond with a good answer. Yeah, and, and it's when it gets personal, when you're personally attacking yeah. the person, yeah. if you, you can avoid that, but you can still be very strong, uh, but some, even some Christians I've seen sometimes, whenever somebody's strong, oh, hey, we gotta be gentle. It's like, yes, we're strong and gentle, but firm. We, yes. we're, we're destroying yeah. stumbling blocks here. We're, we're fighting for right. souls. Right. Now here's the third point in this article here. If you can tell that you're wasting your breath on somebody only interested in mocking rather than pursuing truth, move on. Yep. Have a look at Matthew 7, 6 there. Uh, you might explain to your critic that there's no point in continuing uh, the discussion, unless he's willing to dial back the emotions, really listen to, you know, speak when it's your turn to speak, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It, it, oftentimes, if, if you're giving an answer to a question that they've asked, and they come back and completely dodge that and then want to get on, onto something else, okay, it may be time to yeah, you change Yeah, you figure it out quick. And, yeah. you know, Paul talks about that when he talks to Timothy. Uh, you know, he, he argued persuasively, but then he told Timothy, avoid foolish arguments. Well, what's a foolish argument? Yes. It's one that's really not going anywhere. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, um, anyway, um, great uh, information on the website, information that we use to, to put these shows together. You want a free copy of Creation Magazine? Go yes. to the website and uh, you can put in the, a code there and uh, get a free copy of uh, Creation Magazine.